Well, good morning. It's so exciting to be here with you today. And I give you greetings from Canada. I'm uh, blessed to be in your country. I'm enjoying it. Um, I have never been to India before, so this has been an experience for me. And, but I'm very, very thankful to be here. And I just have loved the people and just loved what I've seen so far because uh, it's amazing to see how God is moving all over the world. And uh, he's everywhere, and it's so awesome to see that we're the same spirit when we know Christ Jesus. I'm going to share you a message this morning that is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I just love talking about this, and I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. And I'm going to be talking about the cross of Jesus Christ, but more than what you may have heard, because there's so much to the cross or to the message of the cross, and it's just amazing when we understand everything that God really has done for us. So many people, they talk about the cross and they talk about it as the place of salvation and it is and it's an amazing thing what God did for us, dying for our sins and setting us free from the bondage of sin and giving us a new life in Christ and that's really the most important message of the cross. But there's so many more things that God did through the cross that we need to understand that are uh, amazingly life-changing things. Now I want to tell you a little bit about myself first. And um, this is important because, you know, sometimes we hear speakers and we think, oh, well, you know, you're in ministry and you've got it all together and, you know, your life isn't as hard as mine or you haven't had to go through the things that I've had to go through. And I don't care who you are, we've all had to go through stuff. We've all had issues and circumstances and things that we've needed to overcome in our lives. Now, um, when I was uh, born into a family, I was born into a very dysfunctional family. I used to think we were the only ones in a dysfunctional family. Now, I know everybody's from a dysfunctional family. Some are just maybe a little more than others. Um, but in my case, my father was a very abusive alcoholic and a compulsive gambler. And he used to physically beat my mother and uh, would gamble all the money away or use it on alcohol. And uh, there were a lot of issues we had in my early years as a child. And then my parents... Uh, broke up when I was five years old. The police took my father away, and I never saw him again until I was an adult. My mother got married again and divorced again and married again and divorced again and married again and divorced again. She got married five times. And um, so, you know, as a child, you're going through all this stuff, and it's um, you don't understand, and you don't have control over what's going on in your life. And the things that happen to us as children mold us and shape how we see ourselves. And so I grew up feeling very inferior feeling a lot of shame, feeling that I wasn't good enough, feeling that something was wrong with me. And, I, and those feelings were very real and very strong. And, and they impacted how I related to people and how I saw myself and how, what I did and the decisions that I made. And so when I got into my early teenage years, now I don't know, you know what it's like here in India, but in North America, you know, a lot of times teenagers become really rebellious against their parents and and I became very rebellious, and I got into a lot of stuff I shouldn't have got into. And I was getting very, very messed up. But it had everything to do with what I was believing about myself. And then when I was 18 years old, somebody invited me to a Bible study. And through that Bible study, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And everything changed. And God did amazing things in my life. And I, for the first time, had hope and faith and started to see myself as God saw me and began to believe that I had a purpose and I was here for a reason. And, and so I was very, very excited to learn that. And I, I dug into the word of God and I got God's word in my heart and I was growing and doing really good. And then over time, I got into full-time ministry and, um, you know, God was doing all kinds of things in my life and it was really, really good. But how many know, you know, as a Christian, you get excited and you're passionate about God when you first give your life to the Lord, but sometimes because circumstances and things happen even after we become a Christian, we can lose that passion that we had at one time, and we can become complacent, and we can uh, become too familiar with the Word and with things, and it doesn't have the same excitement as it first did when we first found out about God and His love. And so because I was in leadership... You know, I had to deal with a lot of people, and I had to do a lot of things, and, and my heart had grown a little distant from God, and because people hurt me sometimes, and I had some rejections and betrayals and things happened, I had guards around me. How many know we don't like to get hurt, right? 
And so to avoid getting hurt, we put walls around our heart. And that's what I had done, not realizing that when I did that, I was not only putting walls around my heart against people, but also towards God. And even though I still loved God, and I was serving him, and I was desiring him, but I felt less passion and excitement about him than I did in my early years. And so I started crying out to God because I knew the scripture said, warned us about losing our first love for God. And so I wanted it, but I didn't know how to get it back. And so finally, I, I just kept praying. And for a few years, I was just praying, God, I want my passion back. I, I just don't have that same desire. Even though I was praying and I knew God, I wasn't doing anything sinful or anything like that. And I was serving as a leader, a pastor's wife, but I just didn't have the same desire that I had once had and um, but one day the Holy Spirit or actually one day a movie came out and some of you probably have seen this movie I know it's been over all over the world and that was the movie The Passion of the Christ and if you've never seen that movie I really encourage you to see it I went to see it and um, the day I went to see it I actually went by myself um, and I, I was in I actually saw it twice the first time I didn't watch it because I don't like violence and so I kind of looked down the whole time so I didn't really get much out of it the first time but my husband made me go back and see it the second time and um, and he told me you know I needed to watch it because I had to preach that Sunday and explain it to the church because we had rented the theater to show uh, the church to bring people that weren't saved so anyway I go back to the theater this the second time and this time I watched the movie and I was always the type of person because in my, in my childhood, I was the oldest of, of my mother's kids. I had a brother and sister that were from her, my father. And then I had another brother from another father and a sister from another father. So there was five of us, but I was the oldest. And so being the oldest, you know, you always have to be strong for everybody else. It's like you have to kind of be in charge and hold things together. And so I had taken on that role as a child. And then going into the ministry, you know, as a pastor's wife, I took the same kind of role on where I had to be strong for everybody else. And so I was always kind of pushing my feelings down, denying my feelings. When things happened to me or people hurt me, I would choose to love them and I would choose to forgive them, but the feelings didn't always line up. And I would just push my feelings down because I didn't know what to do with them. And so I was always strong for everybody. And so when I watched this movie... Um, everybody in the theater was crying and falling apart and I was just sitting there kind of because I hardly ever cried I would always I was so used to denying my feelings and um, so I just sat there and watched the film and then I went home and as soon as I went into my living room and I was by myself in the house something supernatural happened to me and it totally totally changed my life and um, what happened was, I t- the first thing that happened, I walked in the house, I sat down, and all of a sudden, I started crying uncontrollably, and I, I couldn't stop. I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. But in my mind, I saw this huge cross. By the way, I really like your pulpit. And um, I saw this huge cross, and all of a sudden, all of these events and things that happened to me throughout my life, even as a child and, you know, as I was growing up, and then, you know, things that happened to me in ministry, all these thoughts of traumatic and and difficult things that happened to me were coming to my mind. And as they came to my mind, I could kind of see them pass through the cross. And as they passed through the cross, I felt this incredible love and joy and peace. And I can't even describe the feeling I was getting each time. It was just like this amazing, amazing feeling. And this went on for quite a while. And I was crying and crying. And and, and it was just like God was supernaturally kind of doing an inner healing in me. And when it stopped, I remember thinking, wow, if I had to go through every horrible thing in my life to have this experience again with God that I was having at that moment, I'd do it again in a minute because it was so amazing. I never felt so much love and so much joy and so much peace in my entire life. It was just over the top. And then on to- as well as that, I, I had this thought come in my mind right away that was, what do you really know about the cross of Jesus Christ? And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, I know Jesus died for our sins, and I know, you know, we go to the cross to get saved, but Jesus isn't on the the cross anymore, so we kind of go on from there, and we're, you know, we live our life in the spirit of God and and all that. But the Lord kept telling me, there's more, there's more. And so I, I knew there had to be more. So I started studying the cross, and I went and bought every book I could find in print on the cross. I brought, I went to every bookstore I could find. I went online and ordered books, and 
uh, read everything I could about the cross, and I kept a journal. And in the journal, I would write the title of every book, and then I'd write the author, and then I'd write any revelation that I got on the cross from that particular book. And I did this with a, in a year and a half, I read about 25 or 30 books. And as I was doing that, I cannot even describe what God did in my life. I was just so full of love and joy and passion for God, more than even when I first got saved. And my love and my love for my family, my love for my church, my love for God, my love for everything, the passion was there, and it was just so amazing. And then the Lord began to deal with me, and he said, a lot of believers, they go to the cross to get saved, but they don't realize that we need to live a cross-centered life. The cross is the standard of the character of God. The cross reveals to us everything we need to know about God. There, are so, there is so much revelation and so much power in the cross of Jesus Christ. And God does everything through the cross. Everything we ever need or could need was accomplished at the cross of Jesus Christ. And one of the things I had learned and realized, even myself as a Christian, that many Christians struggle with the belief of God loving them. They struggle with it. And, and part of that is, is because God is perfect. You know, God is perfect in every way, and we're not. And we're always falling short. You know, we always fall short of God's perfection. And because of that, you know, the devil comes in and, and puts condemnation on us and makes us feel like we're not worthy or we're not good enough or that God can't really love us because, you know, of what we've done. Or, you know, we, we just go through all of these negative thoughts and feelings about ourselves. And the devil's just there to accuse us all the time. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he's constantly there to get us to believe that we're not good and that God rejects us. And those are lies from the devil. And if we, and, and so because of that, many Christians, in their head they might hear and say, God loves me, but in their heart, they really are not rooted and grounded in the love of God the way they need to be. And the cross is the only place that you can become so rooted and grounded in God's love that you will never move or sway from that. And until you really know God and know his love, you'll never have the victory that you need. You'll always disqualify yourself or you'll always believe something that the devil tries to throw at you to keep you from receiving the promises of God and making you believe that you're not good enough or, or you, you, you know, there's something wrong with you. And so in my experience as a leader, because when I had this experience with the cross, I was saved at that point in time 33 years. And, um, I, you know, I'm in my 60s. And I have 16 grandchildren. And so... You know, at that time, I had been serving God for a long time. I was, you know, I was 33 years old and, or 33 years old in the Lord, not 33 years old. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I knew a lot. I'd seen a lot in the body of Christ. I was in leadership. I knew a lot of ministries and leaders, and I saw so many of them struggling in their walk and in their faith, and many of them falling away and backsliding because of things that happened in their lives. And the Lord told me and showed me that it's because the church has moved away from the cross and that we don't understand the power of the cross. Now, I'm going to read some scripture right now just to um, validate what I'm saying. And I want to state this, though. When I talk about the cross, I'm not just talking about the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ, but I'm talking about the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because you can't separate it. It's one event, and all of it goes together. You couldn't have the resurrection without the suffering and the death, but you can't, uh, but without the resurrection, the suffering and death are meaningless. They, they didn't accomplish anything. And so we have to realize the work of the cross is a complete work. And a lot of the church separates it. There's a lot of churches, they just focus on the suffering and the dying, and they never have life. They never get to the other side. They never get to the resurrection. And then there's other churches, they just want to focus on the resurrection, but they don't realize that there's a suffering and dying process to get life. And so God revealed to me that the cross is a standard, a way of life that God has revealed to the church so that we can walk in victory. Jesus said if we lose our life, we will find it. But if we try to hang on to it, we will lose it. And the cross is a message that reveals that principle to us. Now, I'm going to read some scriptures. The first one is Galatians 
And it says, as for me, and this is written by the Apostle Paul, who was probably one of the greatest evangelists in his time and, and really shared the gospel to the Gentile world. He was the, the leader, the forerunner, sharing the gospel to the Gentile world right after Christ uh, died and rose again. And, and he said this, and he wrote a lot of the New Testament. He said, as for me, in other words, he's talking about, this is about me. This is what I say for me. He says, I, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified or put to death. And the world's interest in me has also died. Now, he made a statement there, and he's saying, I am going to focus. I am going to make the cross the center of my life. I'm going to talk about the cross. I'm going to boast about the cross. The cross is my message. It's what God has called me to talk about. But he said, because of that cross, my interest in this world has passed away or is crucified. And, that, and see, one of the things I've seen in the church and with a lot of believers is they've got too much of the world in them. They're too focused on this world and not enough on the world to come. And so we get caught up in the cares of this world. And when we get caught up in the cares of this world, you know, and they become more important to us than the things of God, then we lose our passion for God. We begin to lose the joy of our salvation. We begin to lose our faith. We begin to walk as mere men and women rather than the kings and queens and ambassadors that God has called us to be as overcomers in this world. And so the Apostle Paul made the statement, I'm going to keep my focus in the right place. And if I keep my focus on the cross of Jesus Christ, and I really understand it, then this world isn't going to be as important to me. It won't matter as much. But the other thing that will happen too is the world's not going to really like you. Because the world hates the message of the cross. The world hates that message. And the reason the world hates that message is because the cross reveals to us how much we need God, how we cannot earn our own salvation. We could never be good enough because God is perfect and he is holy and he is pure and he is righteous and he is absolute perfection in every way. But man, in our hearts, we are selfish. We are full of pride. We have so much sin that abounds in us. And the natural man wants to believe that we're good enough on our own and that we don't need a Savior. Every religion teaches that you can do works to get saved. But Jesus doesn't teach that. He says there's nothing we can do to be good enough. But once you find the love of God, once you experience the work of the cross, you'll do good works. The good works aren't going to get you saved, but you're going to be motivated to do them because God's love's in your heart. And if his love's in your heart, you're going to do good works. See, you understand that principle. And, and so what's good enough? How do we ever measure what's good enough? How do we ever measure how we can get to heaven or who's good enough? None of us, the Bible says, is good enough. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God and the goodness of God. And so we all need a Savior. So the world hates that because our pride that often doesn't want to acknowledge that we can't do it on our own and that we need help. We all desperately need help. You can look at this world and look at the condition of this world to know we need help, right? We need God in our lives. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, it says, For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. There is so much power in the cross. You have no idea how much power is in the cross. The cross is the most powerful, powerful thing that has ever transpired on planet Earth. The power has, the cross has the power to take a hardened criminal, murderers and rapists, and bring them to their knees, repenting, and change their hearts into men or women of God that love people. The cross has the power to deliver us from every sin, from every bondage, 
from the curse of the law, the curse that is on this earth. It has the power to deliver us from the power of Satan. It has the power to cause us to rise above every circumstance and, and to take hold of God's promises and make them ours. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Now, obviously, the most important thing about the cross is that Jesus died for our sins. And because of us receiving him into our hearts, we have access to the throne room of God and we have access to go into heaven when we die. And that's the most important thing. But he did even more than that. He did so much more than that. But to get there, we, to get to that place where we can receive all the other things he did, we have to acknowledge that we're sinners and that we need a Savior. Don't justify or make excuses for your sin. And some people say, well, you know, how do I know Jesus is the only way? Because Jesus said he was the only way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one can get to the Father but by me. And he meant that through the cross, by going through the cross. And if there was another way, God would not have made him, his son that he loved, suffer and die on the cross. Because even just before his death, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was kneeling before God, praying and sweating drops of blood because he was in so much anguish. And he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. In other words, he's saying, Father, can there be another way that people can get reconciled to you? But there was no other way. God would never have put his son through that if there were other ways to God. And if Jesus said he was the only way and he wasn't, that would have made him a liar. Colossians 1.15 tells us this about Jesus. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over everything. See, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And one of the things, as I was sharing a few minutes ago, many Christians struggle with is how much God loves them. You cannot look at the cross And look at the suffering and the death that Jesus went through for you, for your sins. You cannot look at that and say, while you're looking at it, oh, you don't love me, God. Don't believe the lie that God doesn't love you. It doesn't matter what you've done. His mercy is new every morning. He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God sees us through the cross. He sees us through the blood of Jesus. He sees us as righteous. See, the cross will reveal to us what's really in our hearts. It reveal to us the sin. See, I can go to the cross and I can, I can, you know, I ask God to check my heart every day, you know. I shared this with the leaders last night, how the most important thing, that God cares about with us as human beings is the condition of our heart. That matters to him more than anything because that's what's going to make the difference for us and what we accomplish in this life and in eternity. God wants us to love him with our whole heart, soul, and mind. He, He died for us so that we could know him and be like him. And so every day, you know, I have to take my heart to the cross and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to me what's in my heart. And all I have to do is look up at Jesus and see the heart of Jesus when he hung on that cross and see the love and see the unselfishness and see the way he gave everything, to see the obedience he had to the Father, the willingness to do whatever it took to obey God and and to to be a blessing to us as, as human beings. When I look at his heart and I see that he was so willing and so open to go through hell and back to win us, And then I see what's in me. And I see my selfishness and my pride. And that's a big thing about Jesus on that cross was he demonstrated the humility of God. Here he was the creator of all things. 
the one that called everything into existence, that holds everything together. He's God. He made all the universes and stars and everything in the heavens. I mean, he's so vast and so great. We can't even imagine how great and big God really is. And here he brought himself to this, the lowest place you could ever imagine, to the most humiliating place you could ever imagine being in. And demonstrated his humility. And I look at that and I see how proud I still am. And how sometimes I do things with wrong motives. Jesus didn't have a wrong motive in what he did. He did it out of a pure heart. He did it out of pure love. For every one of us. He loves you that much. And everything that he went through. You know, I used to wonder why did he go through so much? And, you know, you read the Old Testament when they, when the high priest would offer a lamb uh, for the sacrifices of the sins of Israel, and they would take that animal, and they would put it on the altar, and they would slit it. So they would put their hands on the, on the animal and transfer their sins, the sins of the nation, into the animal through prayer. And then they would slit the animal's throat, and the animal would die a quick, quick easy death. And Jesus could have died that way and still been the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He could have died a quick and easy death. or he could, They could have just slit his throat and could have been over with really quick. They didn't have to torture and beat him and go through all the stuff that he went through first. But he chose to go through because he took on all of our sin, not just in the spirit realm, but literally he went through the sins of man, every bit of it. He experienced, he experienced betrayal because every one of us has been betrayed or maybe we've betrayed people in our lives and that betrayal is like someone stabs you in the heart and rips you apart and makes you feel like you're worthless and you're nothing. And many people, they, they backslide when they get betrayed or they give up and they quit or uh, they just, you know, they can't go on. Or many people have committed suicide over betrayal or ended up in psychiatric hospitals. They just couldn't handle it when somebody they loved betrayed them. And yet it was somebody Jesus loved because the Bible says he loved his disciples and he loved them to the very end. And one of his disciples betrayed him. He didn't have to be betrayed. They could have just kept going and taken him. But he, he purposed to go through betrayal because he saw your betrayal. He saw the devastation it brought in your life. He saw the the pain and the the horror that you experienced, and he experienced it himself. And he went through false accusations and went through everything, shame, humiliation. He was stripped and beaten and ridiculed and mocked and treated despicably. He did it for us. Some of you were beaten. Some of you were stripped and humiliated. Maybe some of you were raped or some of you were made fun of and mocked and bullied. But Jesus knows. He knows that he went there for you. He took it all. He took it all for us. Because he wanted you to know how much he loves you. And how he could connect with you even in your pain. The cross tells you everything you need to know about God and God's character. You know, the Bible tells us that God's righteous, good, holy, just, kind, loving, forgiving, faithful. All these amazing things. But Hebrews, I believe it's 4.2, says that Jesus demonstrated the very character and nature of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the cross demonstrated to us what God, the one true and living God, is really like. Tells you everything you need to know. The cross shows us the attitude that Jesus had towards others. Even though people were hurting him, he was dying for them. Jesus taught about loving our enemies, and on the cross he demonstrated how. Jesus taught us about forgiving others, and on the cross, he showed us how. The cross will enable you to be joyous and content under all the cares and trials of this life. 
It will teach you how to overcome any circumstance. The cross is the, the foot of the cross is the nearest spot to heaven, and all of heaven's blessings are found there. The cross is the separation of good and evil. It divides good and evil. We live in a world that's caught up between good and evil. We live in a world that's caught between heaven and hell. We have some of heaven on earth and we have some of hell on earth. But our choices while we're on earth will determine our destiny. And we have one choice that we need to make. And that's the choice of embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. And knowing that God sent his son to die for us and for our sins. So that we could forever live for him and in his kingdom. And know him. And when he comes into our hearts, he begins a work in us that the Bible promises he will finish. And he will do that work and he will conform us into the image of his son. See, when man was first created by God and fell away from God, they needed to be reconciled back to God, to that place we were created to be in the first place. And Jesus has brought us back to that place where we can know God and walk with God. Everything God did on, on the cross. The cross is the most central fact of God's moral universe. How many have heard uh, Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end? Do you know that the cross is the beginning and the end of all things? It is the central point of all that exists. You're either on one side of it or the other. There's life on one side and there's death on the other. There's evil on one side and there's good on the other. There's the love of God on one side and the wrath of God on the other side. The cross is the end of your old life and the beginning of your new life. The cross is the beginning and the end of all that exists. The cross is so powerful. It's the end of the wrath of God and the beginning of God's mercy and grace. It is where righteousness and unrighteousness meet. It determines your destiny. The entire word of God points to the cross. When you read through the Old Testament, there's types of, of the cross all through the Old Testament that point to the work of the cross. And, of course, in the New Testament, it talks about the cross and all that Jesus accomplished there. It transcends time. It has p the power to deliver and save everybody that went before it and everybody that comes after it to the end of to when Jesus comes back. The cross shows the, the heart of man, the true heart of sin-fallen man and the corruption and the evil that they will, st they will stoop to and how they treated Jesus. But it shows, how, it shows how God's creation treats him, but how the creator treats us. The cross is the light that reveals to us the heart of God and the way to go. It reveals to us the brutality of sin. You know, we walk a fine line. If we get away from the cross, one of two things happens. We either become self-righteous and think we're too good and better than, which God detests, self-righteousness, or we fall under condemnation and we think we're no good and we're condemned and we have no hope. That's why we have to stay focused on the cross because the cross will keep us in that perfect frame of mind, that perfect understanding that we are the righteousness of God, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. It never condemns us. It reveals our sin, but it doesn't condemn us. It always shows us and keeps us in that perfect balance of where we are and who we are. And it always always, when you see it for what it is, puts you in awe of God and overwhelms you with his love and gives you the ability to do what you couldn't do on your own. The cross is the ultimate manifestation of the living word of God. It brings you great joy when you really comprehend it, and it brings you to your knees 
and gratitude and thanksgiving that changes how you see everything and everyone. It puts everything in the right perspective. You cannot look at the cross and love sin. The cross will cause you to hate sin, but not hate yourself or hate the sinner. We can read in Ephesians 3. I'm going to read verse 16 to 19. It says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow, grow down into God's love, and it keeps you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, we should all be able to understand this, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then, 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 when you understand as much of the love of God, when you get the the height and the depth and the bread, when you get overwhelmed with that love, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. On the cross, death was conquered for us. And with the cross, we will conquer death in us. And like our Lord Jesus Christ, in dying we will live, and by death we overcome death. It's amazing. The cross is so amazing. The cross is the most powerful weapon that we have. Satan will do anything to move us away from the cross because the cross defeated him. He thought he was defeating God. And the very thing he thought he was doing to defeat God was the very way God defeated him. I think that's awesome. (laughs) I think that's awesome. God loves you. I can say that the cross proves it. The cross proves everything the word says about God. It delivers us from all our uh, condemnation. It's the end of the law and the beginning of life in the spirit. It's peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Now one of the things, the number one thing that keeps us from the cross is sin. Either our own sin or the sins of others. I want to just read a story in Numbers, and I'm going to close with this. Numbers 21, verse 4, and it's talking about when the Israelites were in the desert and God had delivered them out of the land of Egypt through Moses, and and, uh, they had the Passover then where they, you've all probably heard the story. If you haven't, you'll have to go back and read it. But God had delivered them, parted the Red Sea. They're in the desert, and God's given them, you know, fire by night and a cloud by day, and he's given them manna, and he's providing for them, and he's doing all of this stuff. He'd done all this incredible, all these incredible things for them, and they were complaining. Isn't that like us? No matter what God does, sometimes we just forget what he's done, and we just start complaining. We're unthankful, and we're ungrateful. But in verse 4 of Numbers 21, it says, Then the people of Israel set about out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But they grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out here, out of Egypt, to die here in the wilderness? They complained. There's nothing here to eat and drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We've sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole, and all who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of the bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Now this is a scripture in the Old Testament in Numbers 21. Now you've got to remember, snakes are like, always represent sin. And snake bites, when you get bitten by a snake, it's like when sin happens. 
It's either your sin or someone else's sin because the poison of sin gets in our inside of us. We get angry, we get resentful, we get bitter, we get upset. We either curse God or curse man or, you know, we get, we, we, the enemy just gets into our lives. And that's poison in us and it brings and produces death in us. But I want to read a scripture in John 3, verse 14 to 17. And Jesus is speaking and he's referring to this scripture in Numbers 21. In verse 14, it says in John 3, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through So in in Numbers, when Moses held up that bronze snake on the pole, and if they got bit by a snake and they looked at that pole, they would live and not die. And Jesus said, that was a type of the cross. That represented what I'm going to do on the cross. Because when I'm lifted up on a pole on the cross, and all the sin is put on me, and that means when someone sins against you, You need to look at the cross and realize that I died for them too. And I've called you to forgive. Or when you sin, you look at that cross and know that I've taken your sin on the cross. And I've set you free. And I've forgiven you. And you just have to confess that sin before me and know that I've made you righteous And that I've adopted you into my kingdom. You're my child. You are mine. You belong to me. Wow. We only saw how God sees us. We only know how much he loves us. The cross will reveal that to you. We need to keep our focus on the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and know that it brings us deliverance, brings us healing, it brings us victory, it makes us overcomers. We are immersed in God's love. He did it all for us. Let's all stand. Maybe you're here this morning And you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never really understood what the message of Christianity really is. And I've just shared the essence of that message. Maybe you've never known that there was only one way to God. Maybe you've never understood how to find forgiveness or healing or peace for your your soul. And if you're here this morning and and you want to make that right with God and you want to receive that gift of salvation and you realize you you can never be good enough on your own you can't do it by yourself but you want to receive God's gift of salvation I just want to encourage you if you've never done that come on down here I want to just lead you in a prayer just step out of your seat if you've never done that but you want to do that and you want to be right with God don't be afraid don't be afraid used to doing this <laughs> if you've never done that maybe everybody in this room has but if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord today is your day this is your opportunity don't reject what he's done for you he's given it to you freely so if you want to receive him just come out of your seat and come down and we'll just take a moment Maybe there's something in you that you know you need to reconcile to God. Maybe there's something in your heart that you know is not right with him. I want us all just to say this prayer together. Heavenly Father, say this out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now, and I thank you for the work of the cross. Help me to always keep it in the center of my life. To let, it, to let it focus my life. 
to set the standard and to help me understand how much you love me and how much I need to love others. Forgive me, Father, for moving away from it and help me to embrace it every day. In Jesus' name.